house and collecting, retrieving old records from the 1930s, 40s, and 50s wow. from dust leveled uh, leveled pallets and, and and bring those back into the hospital so that they could use those records. Now, you know, of course, this was way before the chance to be able to put those onto uh, uh, that data onto the internet, let alone onto your own personal computer. So everything was on paper. Were they microfished or were they hard copy paper copies? There was everything from hard copied paper, which sometimes you would have to be very careful with because it could crumble on you or yeah. to microfish just depending on what it was that was um that how it was stored and um i did that for a couple of years uh, and moved back into the file room and worked the file retrieval area for a little while then moved into uh, deficiency analysis where they would have the doctors come in and we would flag the, the deficiencies in, in the individual paper where it needed signs, uh, updated, things like that. And uh, we would do that and get it ready for central completion where I moved to later on. And central completion, of course, was where you would get the doctors to come in and do it. Well, after doing it for so many years, I moved to the suspension coordinator position to where I was the person getting a really great job. I actually got to suspend the doctors when they didn't get their paperwork done. We called it the naughty always, list. <laughs> oh, it was fantastic. Yeah. And it worked out perfectly because our office was on the first floor down the hallway from the cafeteria. And if you didn't sign your charts, if you didn't get everything done, you didn't get to eat because we would turn off your little meal card that you would have. So the doctors would go in there and have no choice. So and we were set up perfectly. That. That's great. Yeah. So, you know, I, I got I got to deal with a lot of doctors really quick and uh, I learned a lot from that experience, um, not only as to what was required in the documentation, but, you know, dealing with physicians face to face, which is a huge part of what it is that we do these days. Um, got into that. And then after doing that for a while, uh, one of my mentors, who is just an amazing coder and has been a coder probably for as long as I've been in working in medical records, uh, she suggested I go ahead and uh, uh, con consider sitting for the coding test there. She said, you know, I'd heard a few years ago that you had coded some at your previous hospital for the emergency department, you know, just some of the back when they used templates. And yes. you would go on those. So I did that and uh, enjoyed that a lot and went ahead and, and, and sat for the, the classes that you would take to get prepped for mm -hmm. doing coding and, and that kind of thing. Now, at the time, I didn't even, wasn't even aware there was a credential for it. And it really wasn't pressed a lot at that yeah. time. You know, you know, so, so you, you learn by doing, doing it, you know, the, 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 the old term, term grandfathering. grandfathering. You would, you would get grandfather into, into a position when it came, when it came open, open if you were, you know, you know uh, able, able to do the work. work. So, so she said, I know, I know that you'd be great, great, great to give that a shot. shot. So, so I said, test, 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 great, great, you know, you know, fine, fine color kind of thing. And she's like, this is good. Why aren't you doing it for us? And I was like, never had the opportunity. She said, well, let's sit down and get started. So I started doing it, it, found out that I just loved it. It was outpatient, everything up to to observation so that way she would have me cover the whole gamut of it and uh, really found that I had not only an act for it but really enjoyed it and uh, she said well I'll give you six months to a year pass that test for me and let's see if we can get you in so I passed the test did really good on that she got me into that job and I've been working in the coding departments of that place and uh, other contract jobs ever since that's exciting. You know, we, I didn't know that our backgrounds were so similar, but everything you said in medical records, hey, I did all of that as well. Mm -hmm. Except Absolutely. for I didn't have to go someplace else yeah. and go through, you know, uh, everything was already microfished. They had oh, yeah. to have that done. So and I'm saying, when I say pallets, I mean, you had to use one of those forklifts oh, and lift word. boxes of boxes full of charts that were just, yeah. you know, still with the uh, the seven digit numeric system that we used, but yeah, you yeah. had to know where everything was in that huge warehouse. And it just really makes you, <laughs> makes I you love... appreciate being able to sit here and do it these days with the click of a mouse. <laughs> Oh, I know. Yeah, the the I I loved uh, even filing the records because they are going and finding them. You know, like if somebody came into the ER, you mm -hmm. you they call down and said, "I need this." You'd go look up their number, and then you'd go through the big file with the big thing. You turn the big, you know, mm -hmm. uh, move it, yeah, move the shelving out of the way. 
most people think the number is consecutive, but it's not. It's it's like two numbers and three numbers and two numbers. And, and this other it's really fascinating, but I don't know that either. So um, you have several uh, uh, credentials. Now, the reason I went ahead and put the AAPCCA on there is because I wanted you to explain a little more about that. But uh, pretty much everybody knows that the CPC is the you know, um, kind of the mainstream gold standard with the AAPC for coding uh, uh, for physician uh, base. The CRC is risk adjustment, which is so much fun. And um, uh, but can you explain the other three credentials, starting with the CEDC? Explain those a little bit, what they entail, and what made you decide to to sit for those. Sure. Um, as you said, the CRC is the risk adjustment, uh, which on a side note, I would say, thank goodness for your CP, uh, CCO Blitz. Yes. If it, if it hadn't have been for that one, and, and trust me, I sat there and watched you several times really? discuss you, you and Chandy you know, talk about yeah. the, the CRC. And I'm like, yeah, they're the ones that got me through that. Because yeah. I was looking at it one way, and it's a whole different ball game when you yes. go and take the test. Yes, yes. Now, doing the job yeah. is one thing, of course, but you know, yeah. you're know, you sitting for an exam that has a lot more to it than that. So that's the risk adjustment. The CEDC, of course, is the emergency department credential. Now, mm -hmm. since I had been coding for at least two years and was moving up as a uh, as a supervisor and a, a, a lead for the team, which it, now I believe it's been almost a year since I've worked for that hospital itself, but I believe they're up to like 36 ED coders now. Wow. Um, yeah, yeah, they have like 11 hospitals, 26 okay. ancillary, yeah, huge, huge thing here, Carolina's Medical Center in Charlotte, North Carolina. Yeah. Um, I. I gotten promoted by the my mentor who had given me my first option to to try coding i did that and then after a couple of years she's like you know we'd like to move you forward but it'd be nice to have a little more credentialing to you and i just got in the crc so mm -hmm. i said well you know with the experience i have and with the the passion i have for the emergency department work why not do that so that's yeah. the emergency department one, which is fantastic. So not yeah. only are you able to show that you're a subject matter expert, but you can actually, yeah. You know, eventually when I do get a credential to teach, I would be able to teach that now too, oh, you know, which excellent. is always a lot of fun. You know, yeah. the ED is a great uh, gateway. It really you see is. everything in there. <laughs> everything. And every day you're going to see everything, you know, you can mm -hmm. see anything and everything. So we code all the way up to, as I said, you know, when the patient is actually formally admitted, you're going to be looking at a lot of stuff in the emergency department. Yeah. So I did that. And uh, the next one, CEMA, that is from NAMIS, which is the uh, National Alliance of Medical Auditing Specialists. That mm -hmm. is your E&M auditing credential. Now that mm -hmm. one covers inpatient, outpatient, a little bit of everything. Shannon DeConda, her, her group, NAMIS, you know, yeah. they do an amazing yeah. job. Awesome. And I wanted, uh, you know, since I was doing this as well and auditing my coworkers and peers, it's best to have a credential to back up what you do because you got to, mm -hmm. you know, you can't walk the walk without talking the talk. So you better have That's that credential right. to prove that you can back up your findings. That was for the medical auditing part. And the last one um, is from the American Medical Billing Association, which is Certified mm -hmm. Medical Coding Specialist. And what mm -hmm. that does is pretty much show a subject matter expertise in everything that you do uh, and all the qualities that you would need to do the job as a medical coding specialist. That's so that's awesome. where I got that's those. That's AMBA, right? AMBA? Yes. Yeah. AMBA. Yes. Uh, they're great. It is a wonderful organization. Mm -hmm. I've gotten to go to their conferences and um, I haven't got to, to be more involved with NAMIS. I've, uh, I've wanted to, and every time the opportunity, it's like, oh, something gets in the way. But I uh, heard always excellent things about them and the people involved with that. So that's exciting. Yeah, they do wonderful boot camp work. Um, oh, NamUs does. Yeah. They have a E and M auditing boot camp that is just spectacular. I'm I'm really glad I took advantage of that. Okay. Would highly re highly recommend it to anyone. They they handle things a, a bit like you guys do with the blitzing. It, yeah. it works out perfectly. You know. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, focus on your important subject matter and, and disregard everything else. And and, that, and that's where I really got to enjoy the. The auditing that's part of good it. to know because and we're going to talk about that a little bit mm -hmm. here uh what you 
suggest as resources and your exposure and stuff that you've met too. Learning styles are really big deal. You know, um, we all learn differently. I'm a very visual and found out, you know, I'm a tactile learner, which is mm -hmm. odd, but I, I, have to see and I have to touch things and I have to be touching things and so I've always got things on my desk when I'm working like this crochet hook or you know something that I'm I'm touching and I don't know why this wonky brain and there's other people that you know uh that's kinetic well, I guess that's connect but they got to hear it right um, and yeah, I've also heard it called audio your audio, audio learning. that's what it is yeah. I think and kinetic I could be sitting is what here working and have uh, have one of you guys talking mm -hmm. on YouTube videos and everything and, and I can just be absorbing some of that while I'm working. It yeah. seems to work better if I say it out loud or right, you know, mm -hmm. over and over again, hear mm -hmm. that. So. And we did, we noticed that they, they said with children, if you can learn the way that they learn, and, you know, and, and I can tell out of the six children, each of them do a little bit different. And one of mine is a very audible you know every, if he hears mm -hmm. it it'll stick but if he reads it but anyway that's kind of fascinating so mm -hmm. if you find a place that has educational services like that and it resonates with you hey it's it's like finding that perfect blouse that you love so you buy it in five colors absolutely <laughs> you know you, you know fits, when it works it, yeah exactly. stick with that so that's good advice i'm i i'm gonna consider consider uh looking more into that to one of the boot camps so thanks for sharing that oh uh real real quick can you tell a little bit about the board and that this is you know for the chapters uh right. with the aapc so if, just give us a little highlight on what they what they represent and what they do for the local chapters because we are big advocates of being involved with your local chapters whether it's for ahima the aapc um uh you know any of these these uh, organizations that have right. chapters. well um the aapcca bod that's the AAPC Chapter Association Board of Directors. Now what that is, is that is uh, comprised of 16 members from throughout the country. Um, uh, teams of two represent each of the eight divisions as it's broken up. Um, and what we are is, um, it can vary anywhere from practice managers to coder auditors to anyone that you will find at the AUPC national conventions. Mm -hmm. Those people, they're the ones that are getting involved in representing their chapters. And what they do is um, they meet there once a year at HealthCon and uh, they nominate or elect a little bit of both, depending on what is required. Um, they uh, select people from across the country to represent the chapter association. There's a couple of stipulations where you'd have to have been a chapter officer, of course, and, and done other, you know, demonstrated other leadership qualities and other things like that. But um, they gather these people up and, and what we are is we represent the chapter members. We represent the organization and uh, the membership in the organization. Um, I am uh, uh, the Region 4 representative, which covers all of uh, Southern United States, including uh, uh, Puerto Rico and the Bahamas. Hello. Good times mm -hmm. there. There's a Hope lot they, of quarters yeah, there. And they can feel free to ask me to visit a chapter if they'd like. I'd be glad to go. You know, who wouldn't? <laughs> You'll <laughs> be coming to the Bahamas. I know, right? Yeah, it'd be great. Um, but, you know, we represent the chapters and their needs. We, we um, make sure that there's lots of communication out there between the chapter association and the individual members. Um, we go around and we... Uh, um, do presentations about the, the board and the chapter association to make sure that the officer teams are properly trained at the beginning of every year, um, which is what we're um, just angle deep in right now is trying to yeah. get all that done. It's just, um, you know, the, the thing that works always best is face to face, you know that. And uh, virtual, I, I virtual presentations are fantastic, but when you're trying to train and, and help people, it's good to have that kind of face-to-face -face contact. So we like to get out yeah. to the regions and meet as many of the members and the officers as possible. So, yeah. you know, I've got several lined up here in the next couple of months to go from um, various chapters across my region and help develop the officers for the training. And uh, it, it's a wonderful opportunity to uh, devote even more, oper you know, more time to your chapter. You know. I think I think it's good to you know we we really encourage people not only to be active in their chapter but be willing to to run 
to be an officer, there's a lot of perks, you know, for that. And some people are intimidated, even as new coders, I think, well, you know, I'm new, but it doesn't matter They, you know, that is how you network and grow. And uh, we'll talk about that a little bit too. So right. again, being to know that, hey, you're not just thrown to the wolves here. There is training and mentorship available if you choose to to get involved on uh, an officer level so that that's, truly that's is great. that truly is and there's a lot of like you said there's a lot of perks to it oh yeah yeah behind the scenes stuff that that we'll, we'll have to do we'll have to do a uh maybe uh, another webinar sometime that and do a good. chat about yeah. about uh officers and and um and not just with the AAPC, which we're probably more familiar with, we've both been officers, but uh, AHIMA has local chapters right. and, and some of the other groups too, just to say, mm -hmm. you know, take, uh, be willing to, to step up and take a leadership role with uh, your peers. Absolutely. Uh, so, Rick does have a background this with auditing, and so we wanted to, uh, these are questions that I pulled up that we've been asked through the years, and, and recently too, and so we want to kind of go through them a little bit. Um, a lot of people ask, they want, they, they get their credential and that baseline, you know, credential, and they say, you know what, I think I want to get into auditing, which is great, you know, it, it's actually quite, you know, fun. But they say, you know, they understand the reality, you know, how much experience do I need? And first with medical coding auditing, because there's more than one type of auditing that you can do. But so for the, the mainstream medical coding auditor, what, what would you advise somebody if they were saying they wanted to look at auditing? I'm a big proponent of experience, just like you. And I have told I don't know how many people over the years that you can have as many commas behind your name as you want, but if there's no experience to back it up, you're just a comma king or a comma queen. You're nothing more than that. I you know, never heard that. that. You, That's you've good. got to have, you've got to put your money where your mouth is. And uh, I've always looked at it in the other way. If you've got experience, then you should be able to sit for that credential or sh then that credential demonstrates your proficiency. It doesn't, pr yeah. you know, it doesn't prove anything that you, passed an examination and mm -hmm. we all know that there are ways that you can work through to pass examinations test -haters. that's right you know some people just have a great deduction and and they have no trouble with these things some on the other hand they'll need at least a year to, to prep for things and that's fine and, and there are people also just as a caveat to that that are brilliant at the job itself and really struggle to take tests. You know, right. I think Laureen had told stories about there was a, a woman that was in her course and that had been coding for a long time. And she always said she could code rings around me, her knowledge. But she ended up taking, I think, the CPC like five times mm -hmm. before she came and sat down with Laureen because she couldn't she couldn't test. And um, so again, there's there's all know what you need and move forward. So experience. Exactly. Yeah. It makes a it, it makes a huge difference. I mean, and not only experience, but multi specialty experience mm. matters. Yeah. Because if you're gonna audit, a lot of times they're not just gonna give you one specific thing to audit. Right. You're gonna be looking at the big picture. And mm -hmm. if you're looking at the clinical picture of the entire visit for that patient, you're gonna have to put on more than one hat. Yeah. And, and, you know, it might just be that you're looking at the E&M level on that, but that's not always the case. You might be looking at more things than just that. And you have to look at it from a broader spectrum. So you're going to want to have the experience and the understanding of each specialty and what is what's required. By, I was going to say, I, I did a stint with some um, pro fee and, man, they put me in thinking that, you know, I always thought, thought, you know, they thought they had a, a trump card with me or a ringer. And it's like what they put me in, I hadn't done before. And mm -hmm. I, I sunk. I mean, oh, I sunk. And so they started moving me around and real, it's like, oh, no, I can do this and this and this. But, you know, there is there is one thing you don't want to fall into that category of you. Know, you uh, if you can't do, you teach. You know, you got to stay in it at all right. times. And I think that's what happens a lot with instructors is they don't get their feet wet anymore. And so they don't have that practical application to give people to say, hey, when you run into this scenario and you will, because this is real world, you know, um, and so that's the experience that you're talking about. You, if you're going to audit, you got to be able to do profi, you got to be able to do, you know, outpatient 
surgery center. You got to be able to do ER and, and um, do a little bit of everything. That's right. And cool. understand the full gamut of it. I mean, you should be mm -hmm. able to understand a, a quality auditor is going to understand everything they're going to be looking at. And if right. they if it's so far as inpatient, you better know the entire process. You know, you have to understand not only the matriculation of the medical record and the understanding of the process of the paperwork, which uh -huh. is a huge thing. A lot of people have no clue because all they do is study for the CPC. They have right. no clue that there's a whole nother world to it. But then That's you right. have to understand what's going to be involved for this part of the outpatient process was the patient That's moved to the ER admitted, you know, yeah. and all that. That's so why it, I'm so thankful that that medical records training and those years in there and getting to see all that documentation all day long, whether it was just putting it in a specific, you know, uh, order, you right. know, you were exposed, exposed, exposed. And so it just made sense uh, and everything. Yeah, that's, it makes a huge difference. The hands on is 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 imperative. I mean, you can understand so, uh, because you're not only going to be looking at individual documentation, you're going to be looking at the individual provider themselves. And mm -hmm. if you can put all those pieces of the puzzle together, how the doctor does his documentation, what's required for your documentation and the end result, then you're going to be right. able to, to do a quality job. Yeah. For sure. So, um, uh, you know, that great, great advice. I, I tell people whenever they tell me, you know, I try to ask them, you know, what, what are you thinking? What do you think you'd be interested in? And a lot of times they'll say auditing. It's like, okay, so, but the reality is <laughs> you don't want to just jump in there and try to go for that auditing credential, you know, mm -hmm. think about getting involved in some other things first. So there is other things that auditors do and you kind of alluded to this a little bit. What are some other things? The first one that jumps to my mind is is a lot of CVI work, right? Right. Um, you know, that's a big component, but auditors educate too. You know, you know, you're doing a lot provider. of provider. Exactly. Your provider education and documentation expertise is required. Mm -hmm. I mean, you're going to be looking at that full process for that. You're going to be looking at things to trend and track to help mm -hmm. with not only the hospital but or or practice with their paperwork, but also to help the physician to correct that one mistake that's going to make everything from that point on be much better. Right. Huge, not, huge thing. It's not just finding problems. You know, it's also you have to have a plan to fix the problem if you're the auditor right. because you're the expert. You know, mm -hmm. yeah. now, that's, that's that makes a that makes a huge difference. I mean, the documentation improvement, although, you know, it's it's rarely seen by a lot of coder as a chance uh, as a gateway position. Yeah. You're, you're going to be, you, you know, it's, I don't know about your area, but in my area, 98% of the CDI specialists are nurses. I was going to, I tell people and, that too. They say, you know, because I'm really interested in CDI work. That's something that I've always enjoyed. However, when you go to look for work and for CDI, they usually want RNs. They want clinicians. And right. uh, uh, so that is something to be aware of when you, you know, go into that. Oh yeah, I had two nurses in my in a class I was working with um, in November, and mm -hmm. you know they'd had years of experience. But in order for them to do an appropriate job in the CDI department, right. they had to get their um, CDEO is what they were looking at, which yeah. I thought was strange because it was not inpatient CDI. Uh -huh. You know, CDIP should be what you're looking yeah. at. Yeah. Um, but it's once again things where you know it's imperative that you have that understanding and experience to make it work regardless of mm -hmm. what you're looking at. Now, I'll, there's jobs out there, there's um, careers out there that you may not be looking at, but with, you know, experience in auditing and coding, you know, federal government agencies, uh, you know, uh, medical billing services, uh, there's a lot of private companies that do a lot of contract work. Lawyers. 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 Um, one of my friends, what he does is he travels the region and he works with those secretaries that work in insurance companies that apply um, external cause codes yeah. or uh, e-codes as we old right. school call them. Yeah, yeah, and the e-codes. He teaches them how to apply that to the individual paperwork because, you know, in a lot of these mom and pop places, they have their daughter do a lot of yeah. the extra paperwork. Yeah, the and, <laughs> right. Yeah. And, and he's making incredible money going around just educating on one small part of what component. it is that we understand. So, that's I mean, there's so many things out there that they can be looking that's at, that even collection outside agencies. the box, right? right? Yeah, yeah, people don't realize that collection agencies do a lot of tracking and trending that's, too. 
That's right. And, you know, when you're looking at the job of medical auditor, that those terms trending and mm -hmm. reports and tracking and those kind of things are what you're you're going to be looking at too. And if you step back and look at other fields where they use the same kind of proponents in their work, why wouldn't you be suitable to do the same thing? Yeah. This, you know, Whitney, um, she's on a lot of our webinars and lectures, but she brought up a really good question. She says, do you typically have to take a coding test before being considered for an auditing job? Now, that it's pretty common if you're going to go into coding and um, you take an interview or something, they may give you a, a coding exam, you know, right. 30 questions or something. Do you find, do you hear about people having to do that if they're applying for an auditing job? Have you heard yes. that? Yes, yes. And uh, okay. especially if they're saying that uh, the, the candidate must possess inpatient, outpatient whatever specialty skills that they're asking for, mm -hmm. they'll probably give you some kind of, of test on quality auditing in that spe in that specialty or mm -hmm. even, you know, depending on what it is that you're going to do. For instance, That's I saw a recent right. job where they said that um, a qualified candidate would need all forms of auditing skills. In other words, oh. you need to understand outpatient, ancillary, um, uh, ambulatory uh, surgery center, uh, pro fee, anything you can think of that has a wow. word yeah. attached to it. They'll probably throw a question in there about it. So that's, yeah, I would say that they're going to, in, in fact, it's probably going to be more so of a, of a competency test than the basic yeah. um, coding test that they would give someone for another position. Good, good point. Really good point. Let's move on. Uh, oh, can you offer some other tips for networking? Now, again, we, we're always saying this, you know, network, network, network. And a lot of people don't know how to network, but um, there's, you, you can go out and watch YouTube videos and LinkedIn. We were talking about that a little bit. You know, that's a great way to uh, network with other professionals. But what, what have you found in your experiences, uh, some tips that you can offer for networking? Um, well, if we're looking in terms of professional networking, the best bet is your chapter, your local chapter meetings. Okay. That's going to be a great opportunity for not only for you to meet your peers, but to also meet, you know, the pres the presenter that's the guest for that evening. A lot of recruiters will come and do, you know, little uh, visits to chapters, things like that. Um, mm -hmm. I personally, I was president of our chapter this past year, and I know of at least five people that got jobs because they came to a chapter meeting and they mm. met someone or they said, oh, by the way, I'm looking for this type. And I'm like, well, the girl down the hall just said that she had done this, too. Why don't you have to go talk to her? It, yeah. That's where, you know, your professional networking involves a lot of socialism, uh, social networking, too. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, they, they go hand in hand. Uh, but yeah. professional networking, you're going to be looking at going to your chapter meetings and um, if you're going to step outside of that, go to the catch a regional meeting or, or, or a regional right. network or conference, go to a national conference. Mm -hmm. um, we have every year we have the national conference um, for HealthCon. Uh, it's either in Orlando or last year it was uh, this year past it was Las Vegas. I think we move. Yeah, we, we toggle back and forth between years. And then we always have two regional um, mm -hmm. conferences as well. One on the East Coast, one on the West. Great opportunities to meet people. Yeah at a regional level yeah, and you never know who you're going to meet or what you're going to learn while you're there. Mm -hmm. Perhaps you're there and you, you actually find that you'd be interested in additional credentials, additional mm -hmm. training. Sit in a lecture and you find it fascinating and didn't know you were even, you know, would have been interested in that particular right. field. Never a bad you know? idea. Never yeah. a bad idea. To, I always suggest if you get a chance, if you can go, go. It's always worth it. I but think I, the... Not, I the think. regionals are really nice because they're a little more intimate. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, I've gotten to go to several now and, and enjoyed them immensely. Whereas uh, national is is amazing and fun. It's a lot of people, and you know, it's a real good experience. So uh, I would, I would, you know, we're going to talk about goals, but that's something that I would set right. as a goal. To get to now, it's, now for social networking, you know, nothing works better than what we're dealing with these days. You've got the Facebook, you've got LinkedIn, you've got all those opportunities for online social networking. Take advantage of those. There's so many coding groups on Facebook alone. It's it's worth the effort to just go out there and try to find and join some that, that would be great 
advantage to you getting to meet new people mm -hmm. getting to hear about new experiences yes. um, it's a great wealth of information for people we have a certified members page um, on Facebook for AAPC members mm -hmm. and you have to be credentialed in order to join it it's it's a private yeah. professional platform which gives you a chance just to as you're working your day and you're you're caught up on something that you need someone to give an extra set of eyes jump on right. Facebook and put out the problem there and you'd be surprised at how many people want to jump in and help you out that that is something that uh, I've had a few careers you know in, in for being so young I might say no uh, <laughs> but I have never found or heard of another career where people uh, network in such a positive way and mentor with other peers and new people and there are plenty of jobs out there and may you may not feel like it when you're first starting out and you're trying to get a job and you just can't seem to get your foot in the door but there are plenty of jobs and opportunities out there and uh, and everybody in this industry i don't think i've met anybody that wasn't encouraging uplifting and and willing to at least assist you in some way to get that that first job or uh you know increase your uh, career path. That kind of um, is the next thing I want to talk about. Uh, steps for a new person in the industry to further their career. Let's say they're working, they've been working for a little while with a particular job and, you know, everything's been going uh, well, but they're ready to make that. They're like, okay, I, I think I want to do something, you know, uh, more. What, what, what would you kind of suggest they do to further that career? Um, well, um there's so many things that you can think of right <laughs> off the bat. You know, if, you and I have been mentors for years and you know what people want to hear when they get to this point. You know, yeah. I, I passed that test and I, and I feel like I'm, I've, uh, you know, this is a culmination and it's not a culmination. It's the very first step in your, in your mm -hmm. career path right now. Um, it, the networking makes a huge difference getting out there and getting to meet new people about all this and, and understand because the, they're going to be scratching their head wondering what, are, what is my next step? What am I supposed to do now? Uh, that's why I think it's so important for mentors to be out there to develop mentoring networks at your local chapter area so that you can have seasoned coders deal with, as they quote them these days, newbies, helping the newbies out to understand what it is that they're going to need to do and, and how much effort it's going to take to find that yeah. job that they want. Um, you know, they use the term foot in the door position a lot these days. Mm -hmm. And we're one of the few careers out there that really have nothing but an option for a foot in the door career, you know, when you go into this job uh, because you haven't done it yet. So you, you have to prove yourself through experience. And uh, that would be my biggest thing is get your tennis shoes on and start pounding that pavement. Um, right. First, research is a key. Um, you're going to have to jump online as much as you can. Check out your geographical location. Um, is there a, a need for coders immediately in your area right now? Mm -hmm. um, what about the provider offices, facilities, hospital healthcare systems in your area? Mm -hmm. You need to check all of those out. You need to get that resume out there. Mm -hmm. uh, but first you wanna make sure it's the best resume you can have. So mm -hmm. find someone that is a coder that knows what needs to be put on that yeah. resume before you send it out. Um, there's a lot of, of uh, resume building companies out there that op offer that option, especially for ones that are for coders now too. Uh, there's yeah. a couple that you'll see on Facebook all the time if you go on Facebook yeah. and see. And, and you know, that's their priority is making your resume look as best as it can. Because these days it's all about buzzwords. So you better have those buzzwords yeah, on there to get the that. Point system. It's the right. point system. You gotta have mm -hmm. those, those words. Right, right. You, you want to have that done. You want to check out foot in the door positions. You want to expand your, your search. You want to broaden your list. Within more often. Right. Yeah. And not only hiring within, there's so many jobs, like we said, out there that you could probably get your foot into the door and, and, and try other things about it. Like we said, insurance companies, um, you know, uh, dental clinics, there's all kinds of, of yeah. facilities out there that are going to need a coder. Here's mm -hmm. your chance to take it, you know, to do into that. And I think it's going to take experience for you to understand what it is that you're most passionate about when it comes to this kind of work. Good point. If you're, if you find that interventional radiology is amazing, why don't I look 
into that more. First off, it's an amazing yeah. career. It pays great. And it mm -hmm. looks like it really makes a difference and, and mm -hmm. is a necessary need for the, you know, for the work. So why not try that out? Um, yeah. The hardest part like is, is not being able to mentor those that need it. So mm -hmm. uh, if anything, I can say, you know, if you're a seasoned coder, be that mentor people need you to be, help them out individually one-on-one -on -one and understanding of what it is that they're gonna need down the road. Like it's that pay it forward that everybody talks yeah. about. Yeah, this is one of the careers where we can do that. And you know, you find a really great jobs just by word of mouth. Mm -hmm. So put I your face out there and get noticed. I think that uh, another thing that I had thought about too to take those steps is, um, you know, it's, I won't say that's an inexpensive or an expensive career to get into for the, for the amount of money that you have to pay to get into the career and stay in for CEUs and memberships and stuff like that. It's actually pays very, very well. However, I think that one of the steps you can do is to budget out you know, look and see how much it's going to cost you to go to regional, how much right. it's going to cost you to go to national, how much it's going to cost you if you have to travel to find a local chapter, maybe it's 45 minutes away or, or something, and um, how much it's going to cost you to pick up an extra online course or to, to be involved in a boot camp, you know, like NamUs if you want to get into e and m and and budget at that out, and that'll help you hit those uh, the rungs on your ladder for your career I think not only that um, if you have that plan those goals put down on paper and you know this year I'd love to be able to go to HealthCon but that's four months away go yeah. talk to your supervisor and see if that's something that is reimbursed a that's lot of places really that you work have educational expense accounts and, and each they may department not pay it all Right. But if they even pay a half or a fourth, it's a big It of makes money. a big difference. That's right. And, you know, even when you say about pay, um, you know, stretching it out and, 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 and making payments, so to speak, on certain things or setting aside for a budget, the AAPC is willing to, is, has, you know, evolved to do the same thing. They offer even for, you know, for your membership dues, they offer payment plans for that mm -hmm. as well now too. Mm -hmm. uh, every, everything is attainable. And you've been on Facebook and those other social media sites as much as I've been. It seems yeah. like we're always on there, you know, and yeah. they're always talking about, you know, it costs too much to do this. And, and I've mm -hmm. worked so hard to get that credential and have all these CEUs and all this money spent, but I'm not finding that job. This is right. not one of those careers where you're not going to get, you're going to, have to pay as much as you make sometimes that's right you're going to have to put it out there this is it's, this is not an industry that has a high turnover rate no no <laughs> it's a great job exactly <laughs> and that's why people people always say well the door you know it's a foot in the door because someone opened it they left it and that's what it is people are waiting around for that one person to leave that job for others yeah. to fill it so or, if you're or, expecting or to be a the, the, the company or the business to expand enough that they can hire more people Right. And if you want to be one of the people that rises above the the crowd, then you're going to have to not only understand that, but be willing to wait or willing yes. to step in when required. Be there and be ready with those yeah. tools that you need and with that experience and education that you need to get the job. Mm -hmm. That's good. That uh, okay. The future of the industry. People are always talking about it. I know you hear this. They, you know, they talk about new code sets. They talk about oh, everything's going to go to AI and uh, or IA or whatever artificial intelligence mm -hmm. or it's going to go by the wayside like transcription. You know uh, what? It is changing and evolving and everything. Um, with that being said, what do you, what do you see? Not not just from the coders perspective too but the billing and the auditing and all those specialty niches that are involved sisters to a medical coder uh, the medical uh, profession what does it look like do you think in the future through your eyes what are you thinking well, well i think there's going to be huge advances here in the 20s because of of technology mm -hmm. there's no way around that and and we'll have to to roll along with that as it goes. Um, even as far as 20 years ago, if we looked at, at the situation of, of you know, <laughs> 2001, oh, oh my goodness. If, if Even if we look back those few amount of years, uh, things have changed in leaps mm -hmm. and bounds. So there's no way that we can't have to roll with the punches and, mm -hmm. and keep up with the trends and the times. Um, right. uh, in 20 years ago, we didn't have to know all of these 
huge robotic assisted procedures and things like that that we're seeing commonplace right. every day now. I, yeah. I mean, you know, um, we're hoping to have a presentation about that because it's just become such an eye opening. Mm -hmm. topic to discuss is you know how do you how are you going to code that how are you going to bill for that how are you going to watch for anything that you need to watch along the way right and i go right back to the same thing have you if you know if you're describing something have you watched it to begin with um if you go on youtube you're pretty much going to find any procedure ever done or ever has been done has been that videotaped I've so, watched them all yeah. of the time. Yeah. Right. And I mean, as these things happen, as we see for the first time a robot assisted um, uh, hysterectomy or something to where, yeah. you know, that's we're like, been, how did that, that happen? That was a long time ago. Yeah. Though. That's one of the first ones I watched. Right. Now they're doing amazing, you know. Amazing stuff. And, and they, it's, it's all about application. Uh, mm -hmm. How can they apply it to this and apply it to that? Well, we have to be able and willing to apply what we know in all of these fields too. Um, you, you, you work with some really intelligent people that understand that, you know, you have to, in order to code the operation, you have to understand the operation. That's right. And, you know, sometimes we're not taught that in the beginning. Uh -huh. All we're that's taught is how world. to pass that that's, test and how to make that, the test. <laughs> get that job. Yeah. yeah. So, you, it, you know, drown yourself in education, understand the processes and the procedures. I, I think we're going to have to be nothing but auditors eventually we're going to be yeah. looking at um coding is going to be done automatically with with mm -hmm. systems or done by the physician himself as he's going along and and doing his work and we're going to be auditing what the doctor did or we're going to be auditing peers things like mm -hmm. that it, it's it's going to be nothing but that option at some point but right. you know things change so rapidly who is who is it in the medical you know? field you have to be adaptable to change, don't you? Or you're right. not going to make it. <laughs> right. So be willing to get those extra two or three hours a week of, of education. Mm -hmm. Take that extra CEU or that extra class yeah. that, or even that class that doesn't even have a CEU, but has information mm -hmm. that you know you're going to be needing to understand. Broaden your spectrum of, of education too. You're um, more than the AAPC. Look at other organizations, the billing AMBA, the American Medical Billing Association, is a great yeah. resource yeah. for all things billing. Um, a step outside of that comfort zone of what it is that you've been doing and try something new because it's going to hit you a lot quicker than you thought it would. You know, mm -hmm. um, it's always not going to be a production coding thing because that right. production is going to slowly dwindle down. And mm -hmm. it may not even be that we, we use just the, the CPT system that we're looking at now you know i i know you're a big proponent think, of pcs i think and, uh, yeah you've heard me say it's like yeah. i want pcs to replace cpt really it's, bad and, i love it it seems more universally understandable anyway so i think it's it's a possibility that we might not be looking at anything but understanding that and for all those people yeah. that have done decades of work with with cpt and they're going to go oh what do i do with this yeah. uh, you've got six months to understand that you know i'm sure it's not going to be that bad but you better yeah. learn to roll with the punches and you're not mm -hmm. going to set your education hat down ever you always have to keep that Bingo. on Bingo. that's always a really i like that, that phrase I'm, yeah. I'm gonna use. I'm gonna steal that. You, right. you steal all you want. Yeah. I'm an open book. <laughs> I like that phrase. <laughs> um, so, resources. Now, you've mm. already mentioned some, uh, mm. but there are a lot of resources out there. And and like you said, you mentioned AMBA. Paycom's really good for practice management. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, I think, it, you know, honestly. Mm, yeah, people talk about the advantages of having dual certifications, meaning not multiple certifications, but have certification bodies. Like if you have the AAPC, but you also have uh, a HEMA or uh, PACOM or AMBA, you know, and, and I kind of tell people that, you know, if you are really interested in billing, hey, go go align yourself with AMBA. They're, you know, that's the main right. focus of what they've done for so many years. To me, they're leaders in the industry and their support system's really good because that's another key. They have a good support system. Mm -hmm. And then um, also with PACOM, practice management, man, I don't think anybody uh, is as good as them. I've gotten, uh, I was lucky enough to get to go to a PACOM conferences and AMBA conferences and, and they don't, they're not as big as like the AAPC and what AHEMA does. But 
in that regard, you get more networking opportunities, but Absolutely. these are people that specialize in that. Mm -hmm. And um, that being said, can you think of some other resources that that you could advise uh, people to look into or to add, you know, maybe jot down and, and look into? Sure. Um, uh, as for, like you said, you have the AMBA, you have, uh, as I mentioned before, NAMAS, which is yeah. N-A-M-A-S, North, uh, um, what is it? Uh, Again, National Alliance. I always want to say North yeah. American because it starts with any National yeah. Alliance of Medical Auditing Specialists. They do a lot with this, and 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 Shannon they're DeCondo Systems the are fantastic. Best well known auditing organization. I they mean, they've really been in the longest, probably. Yes, and 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 their training and uh, um, tools, their E and M leveling uh, yeah. tools are are spectacular. Um, I, I used Novitas for a while there when I first started, mm -hmm. and got into the using the Namus. E and M tools, and those are just amazing. They just yeah. really, you know, cut out the the gray matter. And it's yeah. just good stuff. Good stuff. Um, also, you know, there's a, you can be looking at the Facebook forums. That, mm. like I mentioned, there's so many forums. There's Every specialty. That's right. A, um, all these um, organizations that we mentioned, they all have their own pages on Facebook. There's also specialty um, uh, coders. Facebook pages as well, like risk mm -hmm. adjustment pages and things like that. Right. Um, AAPC has forums now that uh, that we're going to really try this year to to amp up and get more involvement right. with. Um, mm -hmm. uh, take advantage of that, you know, right. use that information. CMS has everything you need on it. Get familiar with that website because mm -hmm. there's a lot of information on there that you can be, you know, using in your daily routine as well. Um, yeah. Using your resources is going to be sometimes as simple as turning to your next door, um, to your the coworker sitting next to you, and saying, "What is it you use? Uh, what That's is it that you're idea. using right now?" Because they could be doing something a lot e uh, a lot different than you are right now. Mm -hmm. It's just by the tools that they're using. So those are that's the great thing is that and we can. Turn that way. I think too when you talk to somebody and they've actually vetted it, you know, they use it or some or, or they've used a variety, they can say, "Hey, I really like." you know, this um, uh, encoder because it has these things, which mm -hmm. resonates with me versus this one, you know, when I used it, so on and so forth. And, you know, encoders virtually are all the same. Ultimately, the content's the same. It's how they right. deliver it. So I'm a big fan to find a code and mm -hmm. it's not because their colors are purple, you know, kind of had us a purple, we joke. But yeah. uh, from a teaching standpoint, I like the way they're set up because it makes it easier for me to go grab information and then, you know, give that to the people that are asking. It's a good format for me. But right. um, there are other ones out there that are, you know, really good too. That a lot of times people, if they have an opportunity to, to learn or they use, your employer is probably going to provide you with one. Right. But, um, you know, that would be a resource that I would look into because at Find a Code offers education and CEUs and different things out there, and so do almost all of them. Who is right. it the one that sends the jokes all the time, the little cartoon strips? I always liked them too. Oh yeah. Is that or, or is that one of the coding places like uh, HIM Solutions or so? I I can't remember, but they it's always funny because I get an email and it's always got a little cartoon. It's a funny little thing, you know, and. Mm -hmm. uh, so consider that as a, a good place to look for resources. Um, also recruiters, we just recently talked to a uh, recruiter and another resource that you mentioned earlier is uh, resumes. We uh, interviewed also Annie over at Project Resume. Annie Bar and, Barnaby. Yeah, mm -hmm. she was great to, to uh, kind of walk people through things that they need. So consider, you know, using those as resources uh, right now, and I think I've already mentioned it, LinkedIn, you know, mm -hmm. there's Facebook, there's YouTube, there's, but LinkedIn has just started this live streaming right. process and mm -hmm. it it's very new. Uh, there's a lot of glitches uh, uh, almost. We live stream on LinkedIn, but a lot of times I'll say, you better go look at Facebook or YouTube because it, it they haven't got it all worked out, but it's a great right. platform because that's predominantly people that are professionals right. and working with each other. As you mentioned before, the uh, having ninety percent of the time when we're doing our work in a lot of these larger facilities or ones that mm -hmm. that can purchase it, they have you work on Epic, 3M, those kind of things. Yes. But having right. your own 
private copy of a, a standalone coder, whatever it is that you need, mm -hmm. you know, and a good, powerful encoder. Not only that, that gives you all the information you need, but is able to show you when you're going to have to stop everything and go to that physician and show them why he's no longer allowed to use that code in that right. sequence. It Find a really good encoder that gives you that information Mm -hmm. readily so that you can just turn and ex show the guideline or show the specific yeah. you know legal precedent because that you're looking at honestly they don't have a lot of time you right. know and and sometimes minutes, you're <laughs> the thorn in their side you know and you don't right. want to be that you want to always have that relationship where you can get in there tell them really quickly ask me do you is there any questions so on, get in get out and and uh, because you're there to help them you're their liaison right and right. you're translating for them they didn't get into medicine to be messing with this stuff they right. you're the one paid to take care of that for them right um, and there's nothing better than teaching a physician something that they're going to turn around and teach to either other physicians or other staff right. because a doctor loves to be an educator yes. so if you give them the information step back and let them give that out there you have no trouble that's a real that's really good advice i like that too i'm gonna use that too rick um, it is. I've had lots of people say, you know, for physicians are, are are educators. Well, they have to educate their patients, right? Right. You know, and and so that that is true. So uh, excellent. The the one more thing I would say uh, about your encoders by having your own is uh, if you are getting it through work, once you're no longer working for them. Right. They drop that ax you you lose that access and there's content and notes that you can add to your encoder like find code I've got notes on specific codes mm -hmm. when I went to conferences I just hadn't you know find a code up and I was typing notes about the different codes in there for me you know and so that's something that will will never go away right. but again the the other side of that is that that's an expense that you have to mm -hmm. to consider so but expenses you know, in our career are investments they're not expensive. They're tax deductible, right? Isn't it? It's tax time. So yeah. you're right. I, yeah. yeah. Use, treat them as investments and not expenses. It's worth it. Good point. Good point. Um, so I, it, well, again, because it's this time of year, everybody, you know, you, you, you launch the new year with all types of good hopes and, and, uh, dreams and setting goals and stuff, uh, for, uh, personal and professional goals, short term and long term. What, what uh, would you see? And you've said a lot of these already. I've been picking. I was like, oh yeah, that's a short-term goal, long-term goal. So what what advice would you give for personal and professional goals, short-term and long-term? Don't set yourself up for failure, especially mm -hmm. when it comes to a short-term goal. You're not going to have that. I'm going to become an auditor rate. right after I got my CPC, right? right? <laughs> yeah, because she did or because she told me I could or because I've seen it happen. It, everybody's case is going to be different. Never judge yourself by what other people are doing. Trust me, I've learned the hard way. It never works. <laughs> it never works. You just get more gray hairs and nothing changes. <laughs> It never changed. I call them glitter. You can't yes. see in the camera, but I got a lot of glitter going on. That's right. You know, I always like looking at it like, um, what are your goals five days from now, five months from now, five years from now? That's what I like doing it that Point. way. Where are you at here in five days, five months, or five years? Treat things like that. What is it is attainable in five months? Go for it. If it's attainable in five years, set it up that way. Don't set yourself up for failure by expecting too much too soon, especially in this career. It's never going to happen. Because and that's you where may, you can talk to your mentor and say, right. is, this a, is this an obtainable goal? Do you see me being able to achieve X? You know, right. get a second opinion. Yeah, I, um, last year, for instance, I had two particular students. One was a had been a math teacher for 20 years. And she took the class um, online on AAPC by herself, no help other than her own mind, but, um, went through the class and three and a half months and passed the test on the first try as a practice test. She didn't even go thinking she was going to pass it. She just wanted to get used to the test and ended Good. up getting a 91 or a 90 or something on it. Good for her. Had no trouble with it. And she's like, no, I just want the credential for now. I'm going to keep the CEUs. I like teaching, but I want that to be something that I can work into. So I'm looking, she walked into it with her eyes wide open. Wow, on, the, on the flip side of that, I had um, one lady that started taking the, the class and had all of these thoughts of, I'm going to do exactly like you did, and I'm going to take it in four months, and I'm going to pass it, and I'm going to have that job waiting for me. 
she quit trying to take the test after her 13th attempt. Oh, wow. Mm. And just could not get the understanding of it. You know, mm -hmm. this is this is one of those careers where it either sinks in or it doesn't. Yes. And, yeah, I've had know, a few students like that. Yeah. And so your short term short term goal might be modified really quick for the long term because of all kinds of things. Not a good test taker, not a good student, did not study, doesn't get the material, those kind of anything can be a problem. Mm -hmm. So you have to just set yourself up for yeah. goal or attainment, not, not the right time success. in your life. You right. know, oh, yeah. I waited a long time to get certified. I was, you know, in the field and everything, but I did other things until I, mm -hmm. uh, you know, because it wasn't the time of my life that right. that it was obtainable. So, yeah. yeah, those are good advices. I I think for me, I I like how you said that that you know go five days, you know, and and go up to five years. Um, I'm I never was a person that um, was really into writing things down to make sure you know to visualize them mm -hmm. for myself uh, I I just never did but I had friends that did that you know and uh, in retrospect I kind of wish I had because things that I wanted out of my career and I thought that I would have that in my 30s even in my 40s and um, it it, they didn't happen, but mm -hmm. I'm getting to do things that I wanted to do back then. And um, I think my life experiences make me better now at, right. at being an instructor, being a coder, you know, the whole gambit is, oh, yeah. uh, uh, and you have to think about that as short term and long term. But uh, I already mentioned that, you know, I think it's a good idea to get a second opinion, kind of formulate what you think you'd like your goals to be, and then sit down with a mentor and say, this mm -hmm. is this is what I'm kind of thinking. Because again, I've had people call into CCO and say that I've been researching the certification, so on and so forth. And this is what I think I wanted, you know, this, this is what I want to do. And then I, you know, after just talking to them for a few minutes, realize that, you know, maybe you don't want to go get that inpatient credential first. Because from what you're telling me, you need to get into the workforce really quickly. You don't have the medical background to kind of boost yourself up. It's not easy to get into that as, you know, inpatient right out of the box. You know, I would consider getting one of these other credentials first and then stair stepping it up as you go. You know, and, and but they don't know that. And no. uh, as well as like the auditing. Is... I want to be an auditor. Okay. Yeah. Well, you're not going to be able to start with that, you know. and, right. and then, uh, uh, there was a really good oh, uh, healthicity. Thank you for uh, Paulette that said the name of the audit service is healthicity that, that oh, has yes, that little healthicity. cartoon mm -hmm. that is so yeah. cute. Mm -hmm. uh, and let me see if somebody else. Uh, did, did, did. Oh, uh, ooh, I don't know if I can pronounce your name. I sorry, but says do you train for the CRC certification? Yes. CCO does, and and again, you you can go and look at the CCO.us website and see some of the things that we do. We we do lots of webinars, and you can go to our YouTube channel and and stuff. I'm just double checking some of this to make sure that I haven't missed any, uh, because we're live streaming on Facebook, YouTube, LinkedIn, and you know our CCO platform. I don't because I know we're right here close to the end. The resources that that I had in there. Um, uh, I didn't, I didn't even look to see what we're doing on time, I guess. Oh, hey, we did it. We did an hour. Mm -hmm. It's like it is on the hour, one minute past. Uh, well, Alicia, I was you know, you, well, you know, if we get together, we can talk at least an hour. No problem. That, <laughs> see, that's what I was worried about because I kept adding these questions that came up and I I thought, oh, I don't know if I want to keep, you know, this may be too much because between you and I, if we got to talking, we're going to we're going to run over that hour and we want to keep it. An hour to us is not very long, but for some other people, it might be too much. Um, and uh, Whitney made a comment real quick. You're never too old to learn. And that's another question that we get in this industry. They're, maybe they're in their 50s and they say, you know what? I don't know if it's a good idea for me to get into this career because, you know, I'm 50 or 60. And it's like, uh, you're the median age for this career. We had a lady pass her CPC last um, September. Mm -hmm. 73 years old yeah that there's was her no first credential 73 that's right mm -hmm. and especially that's people impossible. that have uh that aren't able to be on their feet anymore mm -hmm. a lot of clinicians transition into right. this industry because uh, 
maybe they well one they 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 can't be on their feet anymore they're just tired of the smells you know mm -hmm. or whatever oh, yeah. uh, and uh this is a really good way to transition with a, a, a good income that uh i did sit down with one nurse i remember when my mother had cancer and i knew she'd been a nurse for a very long time and she was working with the surgeon uh, mother surgeon and i i'm always you know passing out my cards and stuff this was a few years ago and i said um she said, what exactly do you do? And I told her and I said, maybe you should consider getting into this industry because, you know, we make really, I, I said, I suspect I make as much money as you do. And, and I don't have, uh, and I don't have the time in the industry that you do. And she said, I don't think you make as much as me. And I said, oh, really? I said, because, you know, I've been doing this a long time. And she said, no, she'd been a nurse for like 40 years and like 30 of that had been at one hospital. She was making more oh. money than the doctors, you know, it's like, oh, oh yeah. yeah, no, you, that, and that's just a medical yeah. thing. The more, the longer you stay with one hospital, the more you make it. That's and I was true. like, okay, you got me. No choice. <laughs> she, it's like, yeah, you, you, you beat me. You're <laughs> right. You know, and, um, and she only worked, you know, she only had to work a couple days a week to, to, you know, uh, but again, that's the longevity. This is a career that you, you can stay in for a long time, as long as you can sit up in your chair. Right. You know, you can you can do this job, and and it's conducive for people that that have some disabilities or, or aren't able to be in the workforce that stands on their feet and some other things, which we've right. talked about that before too. So, um, you know, uh, Rick, this is this has been a lot of fun, it and is. I. I got to do, uh, I was supposed to do a presentation live for, for his chapter this year and things didn't work out, but uh, it still worked I, out. Okay. It worked out. It was still fun. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. It was good. And, uh, but again, Rick is able to uh, reach out and probably do some traveling or willing to speak for local chapters. And, mm -hmm. you know, we had his email up there. Uh, you can find him on LinkedIn and he's on YouTube, but you can also go to the AAPC and uh, the advisory, uh, the chapter advisory board is all on there. So you can find his name through there for contact information. You can always get a hold of CCO if you want to get a hold of Rick and, mm -hmm. and talk to him. He's out on the East Coast. He's in the Carolinas. Which one are you in? North or South? North Carolina. North Carolina. North Charlotte. Charlotte. Charlotte, yeah, and um, I, I get those Carolinas confused, uh, but uh, so again, feel free to reach out to him. He may know somebody that if there's a particular field uh, with his travels and his networking that that uh, is what you know anesthesiology. We had a lot of questions one week on anesthesiology, and just happened to know some people that were oh, yeah. you know able to mention that or something specific. So feel free to to do that to check in with him and uh, always. Come to uh, you can send message to help desk at cco.us or just go to the cco.us. There's a place where you can ask questions for more information. You can reach us on YouTube, Facebook, and LinkedIn. And uh, I would encourage you to find Rick and I both out on LinkedIn and check out our network. And there with LinkedIn, you can uh, check our contacts as well. So see if somebody that has the credentials that you're interested in, that's a great great advice for networking. So I think we'll wrap it up. Any any last words, you know, Rick, that you want to close this out with? Hmm. You know, I'm always that. afraid to say, I, no, I'm always afraid to say the last words because I'm always afraid those will be the last words I ever say. I always make the worst mistake with that. Um, yeah. I, I just uh, if words you, of uh, encouragement, what can you, words, what words of encouragement that can you leave people with? Words of encouragement. Well, the easiest part of this job is giving up on it. So don't expect oh, anything wow. but don't expect anything but education, but studying, but understanding, but relearning mm -hmm. everything that it is that you thought you knew because you're yeah. never you're never gonna know everything there is to know. So I think I learned that, and that's ninety percent of the battle. <laughs> yeah, I I think I, I mean I literally learn something new every day. And um that's why uh, I like the job. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You mm. see, some it's like I didn't know they could do that procedure. <laughs> you know, I didn't know that drug could be used for that. Or, mm -hmm. um, and uh, I would also say it's to keep your uh, positive attitude too. 
because there are e even when you you could be looking at charts and they can be really depressing and some of the things and you think oh this person isn't going to make it or whatever or or you see something fabulous about you know uh, so, uh, a couple that's tried to conceive and they have their first child after trying for 10 years you know you read about this stuff and you kind of get to know some of these uh but keep that keep that positive attitude uh both daily when you're just working by yourself, but also when you correspond with other people, as well as when you are being audited yourself. Right. It, Keep it, an open mind and a smile on your face. <laughs> yeah, that's right. That'll mean that the, uh, your employer will hold on to you when you, you are adaptable and you keep a positive attitude. That's what yeah, I Be mean. necessary. That's what my mentor always told me. Be that, necessary. That's... Yeah. Well, okay. Three things now I've, I'm taking from Rick to, to share with other people. <laughs> so I think that's it. Thank you, Rick, again. This is a lot of fun. We're going to do it again soon. And yeah. I, I can't wait to come out there to North Carolina and visit you. I want an excuse to come out it, when it's not in the middle of summer, though. So Absolutely. Have we have, we have that heated pool and margarita machine waiting that's for right. you. That's right. You told me that. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Thank Alicia. you very much. Mm -hmm. Bye, guys.